I've been asked to speak about open education resources. As you know, the TACT program has the CC BY requirement, which means that everything that you produce in terms of curricula will be openly licensed with Creative Commons licenses and, and, in, and in a sense become open education resources. And uh, I decided to use the salmon. I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia. It's salmon season right now. The spring salmon are, are kind of coming home. And uh, it, it, the topic uh, that I'm going to speak on is open education resources revisited. And it's sort of interesting for me to reflect back on the, the whole trajectory of open education resources. And I wanted to share with you in this presentation some of how I've seen that whole field evolve. So uh, first of all, what are open education resources? Um, I think all of us think of them as content. And that content can be simulations. You know, you've been uh, talking about the FET simulations. It can also be kind of learning resources that are just pieces of a course. It can be a textbook. So the open textbooks that are available from OpenStax, these are examples of open education resources. It can also be a complete course. And so this is a, a course from, um, from another TAC grantee that has been created and put up in the Carnegie Mellon's Open Learning Initiative. And, and evolving forward, just in the past year, what we're starting to see is complete programs made up of open education resources. And this is an example from Tidewater Community College where they have 21 OER-based courses that together, collectively, they're calling a Z degree. Uh, we would call it a Z cred in Canada. <laughs> um, that make up an Associate of Science degree program in business administration. So we're moving away from sort of little tiny pieces of education content to complete credentials that are made up of open education resources. And the Z degree notion is being used as a marketing tool to students because the cost to participate in a Z degree is less than the cost that they would pay to take a regular degree. One of the most common um, Questions I get about open education resources is, you know, everyone sort of thinks of them as being simply free, no cost resources, reduced cost for students, reduced cost for faculty, reduced cost for institutions and the public. But really free does not equal open education resources. It's sort of a, a first part of what constitutes an open education resource, but it's not the complete part. So when you see free things on the web, they're still completely bound up in intellectual property and copyright. And really, yes, you can go to that site and look at them and use them, but if you want to modify them or change them, or if many of them are time bombed in terms of going away once the student completes a course, uh, free is good, but not as good as open. And so when we talk about open education resources, we're talking about free and open together. And the open part gives you these powerful additional rights. So because something's free doesn't mean you get to retain it or reuse it or revise it. But if it's free and open, then these additional rights come with the resource. So you can actually keep a copy. The students can keep a copy. <laughs> you can use it as is, or you can revise it and adjust it and modify it, remix it with other works. and you can. I have a copy on your own website and distribute it freely to students. So these additional permissions and rights are, are part and parcel of what constitutes an open education resource. And it's these additional rights that are associated with the use of the Creative Commons license. And so the Creative Commons licenses, um, these, this is the spectrum from sort of least free to most free, if you will. Um, and the TACT, oh, this is interesting, the colors are not quite working, but the TACT program is the CC BY. But in general, the OER, what constitutes an open education resource, would fall into these possible licenses. These ones that don't allow derivative works would not be considered open education resources. So it's an, a kind of inherent principle of an open education resource is that faculty and students are allowed to revise and modify the resource to suit their understanding of the domain, the way they like to teach, the way they like to learn. And resources that are no derivatives, meaning you're not allowed to change them, would not really fall within the open education resource category. Another big change that I've noticed um, the last few years especially is the explosion of open education resources around the world. 
And so in my role at Creative Commons, I'm, I'm Associate Director for Global Learning, so I'm, I'm actually doing a lot of work in different parts of the world. And I just put up this site. I mean, here's like open education in South Korea, Russia, Italy, Philippines, Japan, South Africa, Wales, Finland, the list goes on. And, and it's very fascinating and interesting to explore how this is being adopted and how it's being implemented in these different countries around the world. And I know that this, you know, isn't sort of bang on target for TACT because TACT is a very U.S. national kind of program. But my point on emphasizing this is that as the collection of open education resources expand around the world, you'll be able to tap into things that are coming not only from the U.S. and from North America but from other parts of the world. And it opens up incredible opportunities for partnerships with others in different parts of the world who are working on similar academic programs and credentials as you are. So you can actually begin to explore partnerships. And we've noticed this too at Creative Commons. So we've had this incredible growth of how many works have been licensed with Creative Commons from 50 million in 2006 to almost a billion last year. And, and yes, you know, the initial use has come largely from North America and Europe, but it's starting to really grow in other parts of the world as well. And when I'm in other parts of the world and I show them this map, for example, I've been in the Arab world a lot recently. I mean, they look at this number and they're actually motivated to increase and expand the number of open resources they have so that we have a better understanding of their culture and understand why they function the way they do as a society. And the last thing that I'll say about the, the Creative Commons piece is that, yes, okay, we see Creative Commons licenses being used in the education space, but it's also being used in a wide variety of other sectors. And so um, everything from research articles to photos to Wikipedia itself are all making use of the Creative Commons license to make their resources open and reusable by others. I decided to grab this uh, slide from a talk that Dirk Van Dam gave. He's with OECD, and he gave this talk a few weeks ago at the Open Global Education Conference in Banff. And I really liked it um, in the sense that he was starting to portray what I think is true as well, which is that open education resources are not just about content. And this is perhaps the number one message I want to leave you with today. That open education resources are more than content. It's not just about creating quality resources that can be easily distributed and reduce barriers to learning. It's also about generating new forms of learning and creating collaboration between faculty and institutions. And sure, a lot of ways in which open education resources are touted as is, is as a public and private cost saving component. Um, but I think that these things, especially these two, which are the two I'm gonna talk about today, are perhaps where the greatest innovation is starting to happen. So let me talk about uh, how open education resources relate to new forms of teaching and learning from a pedagogical perspective. And this is where I think it gets more exciting than thinking about open education resources as simply content. Um, David Wiley uh, has been writing about uh, what he calls open pedagogy. And he essentially is asking this question. If open education resources have these permissions, these 5R rights that you all get when you start to make use of or develop open education resources, how can we begin to make use of those rights in the context of teaching and learning? What is it that we could do that would change the pedagogy that we're using to teach with based on the openness of the resources? So the, the importance of the open education resources, not just the that it's open and content that you can freely use and revise, but that it can affect teaching and learning. So the idea is that if we're going to make use of open education resources, they constitute a kind of airplane. And if all we're doing is swapping out proprietary resources and replacing them with open education resources, it's like driving the airplane, riding the airplane as simply driving it down the road. And really what we want to do is have it kind of realize its full potential and take full flight. So one of the ways this is being framed and discussed is in the context of what's being called disposable assignments. This is a classic example of a disposable assignment is one that's multiple choice, true, false, kind of 
asking students to kind of quickly answer a set of questions that assess their knowledge. We, they typically don't like these exams, and we typically don't like marking them. And we give the mark back, gives them a grade, but what do they do with it afterwards? They throw it away. And the alternative that we're starting to explore in the field of open education resources is how can we create assignments that are not disposable, but instead have students create work that adds value to the world at large. So I wanted to give you a few examples of what that looks like. Um, this is an example from UC Davis. Uh, this is a chemistry prof that has a course where he is creating a chemistry textbook as, as part of the course. And uh, he has an interesting pedagogical practice in, in terms of this textbook. It's an open uh, education resource textbook. And the students, for marks, have an assignment where they have to contribute to the textbook, write a part of the textbook. Now, of course, the faculty member still, uh, you know, reviews what the students produce from a quality point of view and ensures that whatever they're putting into the textbook is accurate and, and so on. But in, in reality, the students are now producing a textbook that all subsequent students will see. It ha it's infused with their, their work. And because it's an open resource, anyone can use. So the student's assignment becomes visible to other students, to their parents, and to the public. This is an example from the University of British Columbia uh, in the province where I live. The, um, this is uh, something that was done by John Murray Beasley, who is a faculty member there that teaches uh, Latin American literature. And I know Chio is focused on health, but I wanted to use this example. He was, uh, in this course, looking at the Wikipedia entry for Latin American literature. And it was a really terrible entry. And so he made an assignment for the students to literally revise and improve the Wikipedia entry for Latin American literature and do such a great job that it became a fe you know, becomes a featured article on Wikipedia, which you know, not too many become, and you really have to do an amazing job. And this link tells the story of what happened. Yes, this was an assignment for students for marks. It was only one of a whole large number of assignments. But the investment the students put into this assignment far exceeded anything anyone ever expected. And uh, they became hugely invested in creating an outstanding Wikipedia article. And did. And it did end up becoming a featured Wikipedia entry. And this is another example of motivation in terms of assignments. If students know that their assignment is going to be open and viewed by others, they're friends, their peers, their parents, the world at large in terms of a, an entry like this, their motivation to produce an outstanding work really ratchets up. And so I think from a pedagogy, teaching and learning practice, we can see that there's some potential to take advantage of having students realize their work will be shared openly and will contribute to some sort of social good that benefits the world as a way of engaging them. I usually get asked a lot of questions about tests and assignments being openly licensed and the implications of that. And how does that work? Doesn't that jeopardize the academic integrity of my course? And I like to use this example as another way of thinking about it. Um, this is an example from DS106, Digital St Storytelling 106, which is a very popular program here in the US. Uh, it's an open course the students uh, have. Uh, as an assignment in this course, they have to create an assignment for other students. So your assignment, if you're a student, is create an assignment that other students would have to take. And that assignment that you create is marked, you're given a mark for it, and it also goes into the DS106 assignment bank. Um, if you go to this URL, you can see all the assignments in the assignment bank. The assignments are perfectly openly visible, openly licensed. Not only can you see them, but all existing students and all potential students can see all the assignments associated with this course. When you go through the course, you're in a module, and you, it, it, the module might be dealing, with, let's say, with audio. And so your, your task would be to take a certain number, the assignments are all given a certain number of stars. And so you have to take, let's say, 10 stars worth of assignments from this section 
and do them. But the number of assignment options you have available in each of these is large. It becomes really impossible to cheat in advance. And so this is an interesting example of open education resources being applied to assignments and tests and how that might work. Now we're also seeing examples of students being asked to create curated collections of open education resources that supplement and complement the course that's, that's being taught as an assignment. So, so I know how challenging it is for faculty to manage their time in terms of creating course materials that are really engaging. And this process actually passes off some of that workload to the students themselves and gets them involved in looking at and assessing and evaluating the worthiness of educational resources as useful things to include in a particular course. And so uh, this is an example of students doing that with math. And of course, there are lots of repositories now, including the one Jerry's going to be talking about, Skills Commons, where students could be asked to be going in and looking at those resources and pulling out key ones that would be useful for them, that are useful for them, and could be useful for other students. As, and then you can compile a complete curated collection of resources that complement your course. Um, this is another exciting area uh, that's happening in terms of students being asked to create designs for physical houses, for furniture, for all kinds of material, physical goods. Um, and then have those designs be licensed and made available on a site like Thingiverse. And usually these designs are openly licensed in a way that allows you or anyone else to customize the design and create your own unique piece of furniture or house or, or physical good. And so here again we're seeing the opportunity to have students engage in assignments that create long-lasting, ongoing pieces of resources that contribute to making the world a better place. So those are just a few forms of the new ways in which teaching and learning is being shaped by open education resources. And I just wanted to share those as kind of like ideas that might stimulate your own thinking about your own courses. And then the other big change I would say is around collaboration. And this is a really huge piece. And I would say that the big change is that we're moving away from sort of the Lone Ranger model of developing courses to a collaborative model of developing courses. And in that collaborative model, what we're seeing are um, teams of faculty and others coming together to create courses. And also, we're seeing students involved in the co-creation of courses. So, so let me, this is a bit like, uh, I've been seeing some interesting corollaries in other spaces. So here's a, this is just a, a side note, but there's some really fascinating stuff happening around, um, around green, the green, the field of green. And so, the Shared Earth is a site that lets you, as a person who has some land, say, I've got a garden, but I don't have time to do any gardening. And then someone else to say, I'm a gardener looking for land. And it's sort of a matchmaking between the garden and the gardener. And generally, the way this site works is that the produce is shared 50-50. Um, so something similar to this is what I start seeing as a potential and is starting to already happen in the open education space. Um, and, and uh, involving a lot of collaboration. So nobaproject.com, if you want to look at it and you've got your computer open. It's a psychology um, program, set of courses, and it was actually co-developed by a whole bunch of faculty from around the world. Um, and, and so the whole idea of the NOBA project was, can we bring together the best faculty from across multiple institutions to collectively create a psychology program that would be available to, to students as open education resources. And, and the quality of what they've produced is really quite phenomenal. And I, I heard Sue mention the open, uh, the BC Campus Open Book Initiative, which you know, had the Ministry of Education funding 40 books for the most popular post-secondary courses. This is in my province. What the thing I found interesting about this was the way that the students in the other provinces caught wind of this. So there's British Columbia and then the two next provinces are Alberta and Saskatchewan. And the students in those provinces heard about what was happening in British Columbia and they said, how come I'm paying 200 bucks for my textbook when the students in British Columbia are getting the book for free? 
And they started writing letters to the president of their institution, to the minister of advanced education. And as a result, really, of this student activism, Alberta and Saskatchewan have, have now joined British Columbia in this initiative. So I, I'm actually starting to see students playing a very active role in uh, pushing forward for this kind of thing. And, and their initiative and this initiative from the University of Minnesota, which is creating an open textbook library, is very much based on a kind of peer review model. I know, I know Kate participated in the review of, of one of the books, but, but essentially what's happening in the institutions is that um, there's a recognition that faculty will um, be more inclined to use open education resources that have been peer reviewed and have been vetted from a quality point of view so that they have some assurance that it's solid. And so uh, the whole process of getting faculty to collaborate both in the creation of the resources and then in assuring the quality of those resources, and I know this is something Jerry's uh, going to talk about as well, is really a key thing. And I wanted to share this one, not that it's higher ed in its focus, this is K-12, to but as you know, in K-12, to there's a lot of effort going on right now to, uh, in the common core standards all across the United States. And the K-12 to OER collaborative is a group of U.S. states coming together to say, why should we individually create curricula for, for uh, language arts and math? Why don't we join forces and create full, high-quality open education resources for mathematics and English language arts and then share them? So they're actually pooling together uh, and coming up with a, a call for proposals to do this and then the states themselves will coordinate the subsequent maintenance and upgrading and, and uh, enhancement of those resources over time. That's an example of a collaboration at a statewide, state to state kind of level. <laughs> so I, I mentioned that I've been doing a lot of things around the world. This is, uh, this is me in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> And um, I, I was privileged to be part of the U.S. Department of State's Open Book Project. And uh, we were exploring open education resource adoption and the possibility of helping Arab states create and use open education resources in their native language. And I just want to share one thing that came out of that for me. Uh, I won't go into what the whole project was about, but while I was in Saudi Arabia, um, they, asked, uh, they, had, they convened a gathering of all the deans of online learning across their entire higher education system. And they said to me, we you know, it, we know in North America open education resources sort of started at the grassroots level with you know, early adopters and innovative faculty giving it a try, making it work, and then talking to their peers and building from there. But we're going to skip that stage and go national right away. This is going to go big without starting small and building up. And so their question to me was, what would be the success factors for a national OER initiative? And I had until the next morning to <laughs> answer that. And this, this is my answer. I did it all in one page. And I just want to share a few of what I felt were the key insights around that. And I know this is sort of going beyond the practicalities of the TACT program, but I'm trying to kind of present and paint for you a kind of big picture of what this, this whole field is all about and how it's evolving. Um, the first thing I said to them was, because all, almost all of their questions to me initially were in this technology band. You know, what technology should we use? What repositories should we put in place? What tools should we give faculty to create OER? And I kept saying to them, yeah, I mean, okay, those are good questions and here's some answers, but you need to think about some of these other things. And so I wanted to put those other things up front because really the technology piece can actually come downstream a little bit. So first of all, I said, why? Why would you do this? What's your strategic purpose? And the, one of the great things about the TACT program is it has a really strategic purpose, which I think is awesome. It's not, you're not just doing open education resources just because. It's for a particular reason. And so in the Saudi Arabia case, you know, what's the economic or social impact that you're trying to create through using and developing open education resources? And are you going to offer some incentives? This is a transformative practice. How will you get people to engage? And 
ideally you would have a research component that actually assesses what the benefits are from your initiative and evaluates the changes to practice that happen over time. And of course you're going to have to do some, uh, some looking at your policies and your rules around who owns what and how copyright's handled. And, and so there's a kind of strategic purpose, incentive, research and policy piece. But then when it starts getting into how do you engage all the Saudi Arabian higher education institutions, this is what my recommendation was. Within an institution, form teams. Move away from the solo Lone Ranger model and form teams of faculty, instructional designers, librarians, ed tech people, and have them collectively work together on creating the OER. I think that's your best model for success. And then if we're going to go national and engage all institutions, ideally you would form cross-institutional communities that bring those faculty who share a domain together, but also bring together instructional designers across communities, librarians across communities of, of institutions, and get them to talk and dialogue together. And in a sense, it seems to me that with the CHEO project, you're kind of doing many of these things. So, some of my recommendations are really based on what you guys are already doing. You're the model. <laughs> and then when it comes to creating OER, like everyone always jumps down to authoring. And I'm like, you've got like tons of existing courses that already have been authored. Why not just openly license them and make them open education resources? You don't actually have to author anything new. Or go out and look for existing stuff and just adopt it if it meets your needs, or if it doesn't meet your needs, adapt it. And certainly in their case, there's a need to translate and localize and customize things to fit their needs. And then I do think, as I was saying earlier, there's this big need for a quality assurance peer review component. And then we can get into the technology, and I won't talk about this much, but if you have questions about it, I'm happy to answer. And when you finally get to the end, look, you know, you can use this stuff for campus-based courses, for blended and hybrid courses, for fully online, for MOOCs. You know, the actual use cases are completely across the board in all contexts. And as we're seeing with things like Z degrees, it can be a useful marketing tool and a way to allow students to preview content even before they enroll and can be double used not only by institutions but by industry like TACT resources are. So I think there's, this was, I, I just wanted to share this as a kind of model of how collaboration can happen on, on a big scale. And so if I come now to the TACT program, I think there's, in my view, been two, a two-part theory of change associated with the TACT program. And theory part one was that to resolve the low economy and the high rates of unemployment that had been caused by outsourcing and moving jobs overseas, we needed to see an initiative that was targeted at community colleges, not at research-based universities, because they're the ones that are most sort of aligned with working adults. But I think the DOL did a few things really well. I do think it's very helpful for them to ask you to partner with industry and ensure that what you design works for industry. And so I think that's been a useful requirement in terms of collaboration, as was this requirement to work with the public workforce system to ensure that you're creating credentials that meet labor market needs. So I think those two requirements from a collaboration point of view, that's hard work, but I think it results in something much better than it would if it was just on its own. And then, you know, the other theory of change was we want ev evidence-based design, we want stacked and lattice credentials, we want it to be transferable and articulated, we want, you know, technology-enabled learning, strategic alignment, and making use of previous, previous funded tact resources. So this is the big, pretty big theory of change. But, it, but then again, the $2 billion is a pretty big program. So I think it's fair for them to, to kind of make these requirements and provide a, an incentive to resolve unemployment and boost the economy. But this is what I call the first part of the theory of change and the second part of the theory of change was a bit more radical which was that you know the Department of Labor is essentially saying in order for us to be a, an effective steward of public money and to maximize impact and generate innovation we're going to require 
the use of Creative Commons licenses and the creation and use of open education resources. This has never been done before at that kind of scale. And so it's interesting to, to look back now at the stage we're at with TACT and sort of say, well, how has that gone? You know, how has the, you know, how has the theory of change, both parts, evolved and, and is it working? So, you know, we know that they invested a large amount of money across four rounds, 1,087 1, colleges, 256 grants, every state, mostly consortia, lots of consortia within state, but also between states. And then here, just at this point in time, this is what's happened so far, 1,100 new programs. They're expecting something like 2,000. And already so far, just so far, 80,000 enrollments and 27,000 have already completed. And, uh, and we're seeing you know, really great clusters of curricula now in energy, advanced manufacturing, health, transportation, IT. And some of the strategic targets that DOL set around accelerating progress and having better guidance from a career pathway point of view, better student support and retention, and, and better use of technology and online learning. I think you know, your program sets the bar for that as being you know, really an aspiration that you are meeting. So I, I do think that this part of the theory of change has worked out really well. And then if we look at the part two theory of change about stewarding dollars and maximizing impact, it's been interesting for us at Creative Commons to see what's been happening. So the, the TAC program was really one of the first to require CC BY licensing, but now they've actually baked CC BY licensing into all DOL grant programs. And so if a grant program from DOL comes out and it doesn't want to have the OER CC BY requirement, they actually have to literally remove it from, from their particular grant program. And it's already been spread to other programs, including the uh, Ready to Work program from the Department of Labor. Uh, the U.S. State Department is now requiring it and has started using it for their teacher scholarship program. And uh, there's a big meeting happening this coming week that is really engaging all U.S. departments, state um, government departments, in exploring the, re the adoption and use of this requirement in many of their grant programs across the board, including DOE. So, uh, so that's been interesting, a lot more grant programs using this. And, and we've been spending quite a bit of time advocating and make, you know, calling for policy advances. And then, of course, the outputs that are being collected in Skills Commons that you all are producing are hugely expanding the commons. We're seeing this tremendous growth of open education resources mostly in the technical and vocational fields, but those were fields for which there weren't a lot of open education resources in the past. So it's a major contribution to the field of education, and there's a huge appetite and interest in, wh in what you're producing around the world. And then, of course, not only is it the content part, but there's the movement part. And so, you know, the fact that 700 plus community colleges are now engaged in this as a kind of regular part of their practice is a significant change. And the promise associated with the open education resources, of course, is not just that it will be used in the way that you are t planning to use it, but that it has reuse potential. And so already it's interesting to see that USAID is taking curriculum from the TAC program, translating it to Spanish, and starting to use it in the US-Mexico economic development work that they are doing. So um, this was what I wanted to use as a kind of big picture setting the stage of OER revisited. I know this is maybe a high level thing and you might be down at really practical nitty gritty questions about just how do I do this myself. Um, but, but I wanted to kind of set that stage for really the whole uh, time that we're together as a piece from my point of view that's uh, how I see uh, the TAC program working and some of the changes that I, I'm seeing happen around open education resources and the work you're doing.